I have two roles. I'm the Consul General in New York. I cover New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, one of Andrew's colleagues, all part of the network working into the ambassador in Washington. Uh, we still don't have one at the minute, but I'm pretty optimistic that soon we will. Um, and I'm also Her Majesty's Trade Commissioner for North America, which means I work with our trade and investment teams across the US and Canada. Uh, and that includes not only the DIT teams, but the Science and Innovation Network, the Press and Public Affairs Network, the Consuls General, our trade policy and economic policy teams in Washington. And it's all about really trying to bring that together and understand what are the opportunities for deepening and strengthening the relationship between the UK and the US and how we go about it. And we do so, getting to tonight's topic, in the context of the UK having left the EU. In the two and a bit years that I've been in New York, we've been doing it in the context of the UK preparing to leave the EU. That context has now changed uh, as of 6 p.m. Eastern time last Friday, when the, EU, uh, sorry, the UK's membership of the EU came to an end. And that is something every now and then people ask me, what do I think about that? Is this a good thing or a bad thing? To which my answer, and I really mean this, what I think about it is irrelevant. It is a legal fact. The UK is now not a member of the EU. We are in this rather um, unique position of what we call the transition period uh, that will run out to the end of December this year, during which time, although we have left as a member, we are still treated by the EU and indeed by third countries with whom the EU has arrangements as a member of the EU, which means that at the minute, between the UK and the EU27, and between the UK and third countries with whom there are EU third country agreements in things like aviation, civil nuclear energy, reinsurance, etc., etc., life goes on. And during this 11 month period, we are going to do two things. We're going to do lots of things, but two things for the purposes of this evening's discussion. First of all, we are going to work out what our future relationship is with the European Union, the remaining 27 member states. The Prime Minister made a speech on this in London on Monday this week in which he made very, very clear that his ambition is to reach an agreement, his conviction that we can reach an agreement and will reach an agreement in this period ahead of us. There are lots of people who still say that he can't and we won't. He is absolutely adamant and I think it's important to note that he is absolutely adamant that we can and we will. The essence of that agreement will be a form a free trade agreement. Our ambition is to reach a free trade agreement that means there are zero tariffs and zero quotas in terms of trade in goods between the UK and the EU, and we also want to move forward in terms of an arrangement on various services aspects. It's obviously a whole lot more complicated than that, which we may get to in the panel, but you know, those are the headlines. He talks about using the EU-Canada agreement as a model for this, and that then leads to one other thing that he is very, very clear on, which is that there are some, including on the EU side, who themselves also published an important document this week in terms of their mandate for the negotiation that's about to begin with us, in which they say, if you want a zero tariff, zero quota uh, free trade agreement with us, then you must sign up to uh, various what they would refer to as level playing field measures. Um, we would break it down a bit, and the Prime Minister does in his speech on Monday, and as I say, I would commend reading it. Um, he talks about that, well, so you want us to do the same as the EU on labour market regulation or environmental regulation or tax or state aid or competition policy. And that frankly doesn't really make any sense to us because the EU doesn't require that of Canada. And indeed in some of these areas, we would argue that the UK is actually ahead of the EU in some of these areas. For example, on setting a minimum wage. Not all member states set a minimum wage. Not all member states set a minimum wage at the same level as we do. So the logic of applying a level playing field is a bit curious. It either means that we have to lower or even maybe abandon the minimum wage, which we're not about to do, or it means that the EU needs to come up to our standard. And we're not asking them to do that as part of the agreement with us, and therefore we don't see the logic of them asking us to do it with them. That obviously will need to be part of the negotiation that will begin uh, soon. Um, and that will play out. I fully recognise, and I would absolutely concede up front, and again we can get into this in some of the panel discussion, that for the business community, including US investors based in the UK, who over the previous few years or even decades have used the UK as a location from which to trade into the EU, they would like to know the answers to some pretty obvious questions, which is what are these arrangements going to look like, when are they going to apply, and how long are you going to give me to prepare for them? And I freely accept that is a legitimate question, 
and we are going to be working through this as soon as we can in order to give them answers to that question as soon as we can. There is also another piece to it, which is in terms of the UK-US relationship. Some of the agreements that we are part of now as a member of the EU, and as I said earlier, remain uh, de facto part of, if not de jure, over the next 11 months. We also need to understand how we're going to replace them. So on aviation services, civil nuclear energy, reinsurance, you know, I mentioned them before because those are on the forefront of my mind in a US context. Um, we have done an enormous amount of work with our US colleagues to work through how we put in place bilateral relationships between the UK, a bilateral set of agreements between the UK and the US to replace those agreements. And I think we are in a good place on that. One thing we also launched a consultation on today in London was what we call uh, what should be our MFN tariffs? Uh, we, the UK, when we leave the common external tariff at the end of this year, what should we apply from day one, as in 1st of January 2021, should be our external tariff to the rest of the world? There is a, a spectrum, in my view, between where we are now in terms of a member of the EU, although, actually, if you want to get really technical about it, some of the tariffs that the EU applies to third countries could be higher under our WTO obligations, but we choose not to. Or you could just go all the way to zero. Somewhere in between those, we need to establish our own common external tariff, and that's why we're consulting, because we want to know what business thinks about the answers to those questions. So let me pause there on sort of the new relationship with the EU piece, except I would just really endorse the fact that, you know, the title of this evening's talk, Brexit and Beyond, uh, we are now in the beyond. And it's, I think that's important to recognize. The other half, or more than half, of my life and the work of the, uh, the teams that I work with out here is the relationship between the UK and the US. And in the context of everything that we are doing on leaving the EU and everything I've just mentioned, we are absolutely determined to deepen and strengthen the economic relationship between the UK and the US. We believe that we are... Uh, economies that have a similar commitment to innovation, to investment in research, to being global economies. We believe that we have uh, an incredible platform from which to start. The UK, uh, sorry, the US is the UK's single biggest export market. In any given year, the US will take anything from 18 to 20 percent of our exports. That is pretty significant in my view. The UK and the US are the biggest investors in each other's country and have been for a while. Every day, one and a half million uh, Brits go to work for, sorry, forgive me, 1.3 million Brits go to work for American companies in the UK and one and a half people in America go to work for British subsidiaries here in the US. That, I think, is an illustration of the depth and breadth and the strength of the economic relationship that we have, but we want to take it further. You will all have seen, I'm sure, that actually this dates back to the previous Prime Minister, but the previous Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister and the current US President have often stated their ambition to agree a bold, ambitious free trade agreement between the UK and the US. Once we are able to do so, we are now in that world where we are able to do so in terms of beginning it. It specifies in the withdrawal agreement that we reached with the EU that during this period we can begin free trade negotiations, we can complete free trade negotiations, we can even ratify free trade negotiations with a third country. We just can't bring it into force. So we aim to get on with this now. The US, I again would just acknowledge, are ahead of us. February last year they published a document, USTR published a document setting out their negotiating objectives for a free trade agreement with the UK. We are now working through in Whitehall how we come up with our own document on that. This morning in London, the Secretary of State for International Trade published a written ministerial statement in Parliament that states our ambition to negotiate at pace with the US, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, and maybe further down the road, even looking at joining the CPTPP arrangement in the Asia Pacific. So that's a statement of our intent, and we're now working out what the, the substance of that looks like in terms of our trade negotiations uh, with the US. At the same time, we are also looking to take forward something that the Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister and the President agreed when they met at the G7 in uh, Biarritz in August uh, last year, which is something we call a Special Relationship Economic Working Group. That is a bit more nebulous. That is going to sit alongside the Free Trade Agreement negotiation and also something else that we started in March 2018, which is a financial services regulatory working group run by the two treasuries involving regulators on both sides as well as the industry on both sides. So those three th channels running together, in my view, are the key architecture of looking at the deepening and strengthening of the relationship between the UK and the US. But it's not the only thing we want to do. 
And one reason why I'm here in North Carolina uh, today and yesterday is because we are absolutely determined to get out beyond our usual places of business, i.e. certainly beyond Washington and New York and where we have our consulates, to really reach into all of the states of this extraordinary country, which is not easy for us because it's a big country. It's a continent-sized country. But it is a continent-sized country with real diversity across the 50 states and also with real opportunity, in our view, for the United Kingdom in all of those 50 states. And that opportunity will be different, which is why we have to get out there and have the conversation at a state and local level. One thing we have done, some of you may have seen it. If you haven't, we're very happy to share it. We have mapped the UK relationship with all 50 states at both a state level and indeed at a congressional district level. We do that in order to do two things. One, to illustrate the reality of the relationship and the importance of the relationship now. So the state report for North Carolina will show that in our assessment, the UK is the fourth biggest export market uh, for uh, the UK. And we'll show that we believe there's about 17,000, maybe a little bit more now, I think the figures date to 2017, maybe 17,500 jobs here in North Carolina that rest on exports to the UK. It also shows that there are about 38,000 jobs that rest on UK investment here in North Carolina. If you add that up together, that's about 55. I might just nudge it up towards 60, given they're two years out of date. 60,000 jobs that rest on the economic relationship between North Carolina and the United Kingdom. And those are just the direct jobs. If you then think about those who sort of are related to those jobs in terms of sort of ancillary services, et cetera, et cetera, and the, the value add to local economies of those jobs, I think that's pretty significant. And indeed, our assessment is that we are the biggest foreign employer here in North Carolina. And we need to do a better job of telling that story. We need to be out there telling people who the British companies are here. We need to be out here working with people like this chapter of the BABC family, and I'll come back to that in a second, to illustrate to people the importance of the UK relationship. And then we need to flip it round. And we need to work with all of you to understand where the opportunities are, back to my familiar theme, to deepen and strengthen that, either through the FTA, or through the Economic Working Group, or through the Financial Services Regulatory Working Group, especially in Charlotte, you know, still one of the great financial services centers of this country, but not talked about very much because everyone gets obsessed with New York and San Francisco and Chicago. So we need to get beyond those, you know, those, those assumptions about each other's country. The other thing we want to do is we want to work with state level and local level um, uh, legislators and, and governors uh, because we want to see what we can do with them that doesn't mean necessarily that I think we're going to do a free trade agreement between North Carolina and the UK, because I don't think that's really the way to do it. But there is more we can do to tell each other's uh, story. And we have set up a network of what we call senior trade policy advisors across the US. There's one based with Andrew and his team in Atlanta to pursue that agenda. So that's what we're doing. Um, I want to touch on one final topic and then one final theme, and then I will stop. The final topic is that uh, for the UK, um, not only because we will host the COP26 meeting, the, uh, the meeting of the committees of the parties under the Paris Agreement uh, in Glasgow, uh, Scotland, later this year, in early November. Um, for a long time, we have been very committed to addressing what I would loosely call the climate challenge. We are absolutely determined to do so because we don't actually think we have a choice to do so. If we don't do so, then we have an enormous problem because there is only one planet for us to live on. And, you know, we often talk about what are we doing to the planet. The real question, in my view, is what the planet will do to us and whether we can live on it if we don't find a way of slowing all of the issues that we've been talking about ever since the Kyoto Agreement, frankly, and then brought together in the Paris Agreement, and we will bring the parties back together in, December, in November this year. And I think, you know, it is a sad reality that we will find that we have not kept pace with the commitments we made to each other in Paris uh, four or five years ago, but now is a time for us to get a grip on this. But the reason I mention it to a business audience is that we are absolutely committed and determined and also believe that we can do so alongside a commitment to economic growth, alongside a commitment to prosperity and future uh, economic opportunity. Since 1990, the UK economy has cut its emissions by 42% while growing by 66%. So we can do it but the bottom line is that we have to do it. But the business com contribution to that discussion is absolutely crucial. The innovation and investment uh, and research investments in green tech and, uh, and clean tech, in offshore wind, in l electrification, in low emission vehicles or zero emission vehicles. This week, the Prime Minister announced that the UK had already said that we aim to phase out 
uh, combustion engine cars uh, and trucks by 2040. We have brought that forward to 2035. We have committed to delivering net zero in terms of greenhouse gas emissions from the UK economy by 2050. But the fact is that the environment doesn't, own, doesn't understand borders. So whatever we do in the UK, if the world doesn't do it together, we are going to have a problem. And this is a shared endeavour. It is a common good, the environment and the world that we live in. And we are determined to work at all levels with all countries to do so. And there is enormous opportunity for us to do so with governors and business groups and universities and research institutions. We talked to colleagues at Duke this morning. We were at North Carolina State this afternoon. I'm afraid, Ted, we didn't go and call on the University of North Carolina, but I will come back, I promise. You know, and we have to get this done. So that's it. Final thought that runs through all of this, in my humble opinion, whether it's what we do next with the EU, what we do next with the US at a national level or at a state level, what we do next on the climate agenda, is an absolutely crucial partnership that we need to drive and create between the public sector, the private sector, and academia. It runs through something that we've talked a lot about in the UK over the last few years that we call our industrial strategy. It runs through everything, in my view, that our network out here needs to be committed to doing. It's why it's an enormous pleasure to be able to engage a group like you this evening. Please do let us have your challenge, your comments, your questions, both in the panel, afterwards to me, to Andrew, to my other colleagues. Thank you very much indeed. I'd like to welcome Sugata Mukherjee to the front. Sugata is going to be your moderator this evening, and he's editor of the Triangle Business Journal. So, Sugata, if you could come up along with your fellow panelists and take a seat, uh, I'll, I'll hand off uh, uh, to you. So, um, our, our other panelists are Malcolm Dowden, uh, legal director of Womble Bond Dickinson in the UK, and Dr. Patricia Buckley, Managing Director for Economics of Deloitte. And once again, you can find their bios in, in your programs. So I'll now hand over to Sugata. Thank you, Steve. This is quite a nice, intimate gathering here tonight, especially at this weather, my goodness. I was telling um, Mr. Philipson that thank you for bringing the weather, British weather with us. <laughs> so uh, since he pretty much uh, answered all the questions I had, I say we talk about Super Bowl halftime. What do you think? <laughs> I read something this morning I wanted to sort of read uh, to you guys for a few minutes because I think it sort of puts in perspective and then perhaps I will start asking a couple of questions to the panelists and then sort of move on from there. This actually came out in foreign policy this morning. It talks about the EU. The setback, the Brexit, is the latest in a series of body blows that the EU has endured over the past two decades. The first was the Balkan Wars of the 1990s where the EU proved unable to handle the conflict without calling the United States. The next blow was protracted Eurozone crisis, which led to the severe economic hardships in several countries, fueled considerably resentment between creditor and debtor nations, ate up vast amounts of time and political capital. The third was the 2015 refugee crisis, which exposed deep divisions within the EU and gave far-right nationalist movements and liberal, illiberal leaders like Hungary's Viktor Orban in a major boost. Why are we talking about this today? If we're gonna talk about beyond, we sort of need to know as to what exactly happened with Brexit. And we, we'll, I, I think, I, I think uh, Mr. Philipson sort of chronicled it quite nicely. I would like to ask Patricia from her point, from her business stand as to what she, her expertise and then Malcolm to sort of briefly sort of lay the plan as to why are we here today that we have to talk about beyond? Well, to your point, we're here because it is. You know, it's not anything we can push off, well, when it happens, it's here and we're facing it. Um, the important thing I think to think of is 
or to keep in mind is this isn't happening in isolation from everything else. The UK is going to have to deal with this in the larger context of what's going on in its economy. There are other headwinds facing the UK. There's going to be slower job growth this year. It's part of natural of an aging society, so you're not going to get that pickup um, that you've had in prior years. Part of it's a migration story, but part of it's an aging of a society. Um, the core export markets for the UK are weakening. And we can talk more about how the coronavirus particularly is playing into a weaker global economic outlook. Um, the trade friction that granted emanated from the US and China has been a headwind not only for the EU, but for the UK. Um, and you know, there's, whenever someone asks me, what are the risks to the US economy? It's kind of like the same thing for the UK economy. It's like, how long do you want to, to have the list? The US, you know, we can have the trade war with the US uh, and China get worse again. Chi uh, the US could try imposing sanctions on automakers, say in Europe and Japan, that could make things worse. A flare up in the Mideast, uh, the extended impact from things like the coronavirus. So the list of possibilities of things that could go wrong is almost endless. The thing that we know about slowdowns and recessions in particular is that we don't know where they're going to come from. We know the business cycle hasn't been repealed. In the US, we've had a very, very long run. Um, it's not going to die of old age, but something's going to happen. And this is where economists are really, really good. We can explain to you afterwards exactly <laughs> how it unfolded. But telling you ahead of time, which of these things is going to spark a real unknown? So I would say the putting Brexit into the larger context of everything else that's going on in not only the, the UK, but the EU itself with its economic slowdown is really important. So I walked into a bar last night in DC, as you do and to my surprise found Nigel Farage holding court. <clears throat> Couldn't help myself. Went up to him and said, are you here to bond with Trump over your shared love of votes that break 4852? <laughs> but the point that came out of the discussion was further evidence that there is a genuine ideological divide at the heart of the Brexit debate. And I first really came across this when I was reading the pro-Brexit think tank reports that were published in the aftermath of the referendum. And there was one of those little phrases, scientifically proven harm, that pervades the pro-Brexit think tank reports. And what that's getting at, and why it's a bit of a dog whistle phrase, is that it speaks to a very different approach to regulation between the EU and large parts of the world, including not least the US. Um, regulation tends to bite at the point where there is scientifically proven harm here, as opposed to the EU approach which is the precautionary principle. And so I think that at that level, there is um, quite a lot of mileage in what became known as the Britannia Unchained group within the Conservative Party that was looking to gain further freedom of movement, freedom of maneuver. Freedom of movement's really not the right phrase. Um, freedom of maneuver when it comes to striking trade deals and to essentially taking a little bit more of a creative role um, in global trade. And that was one of the things that became very foggy during the, the period from the referendum to the general election in December. Um, the clarity of that ideological debate was lost in the parliamentary arithmetic. Now, I've written loads of articles on Brexit 
since uh, 2016, I've written about 55, 56 articles. And people say, well, how can you write 55 or 56 articles on Brexit? The actual truth is I've written the same article 54 times. <laughs> and only now am I able to say something different because the general election result means that the UK government having a majority of 80 is now able to get done what it wants to get done. So why are we where we are now? How are things going to, to pan out? I'd strongly recommend that you keep an eye on the cabinet reshuffle that um, is expected within the next day or so. And not just in general, keep an eye out in particular for a minister by the name of Rishi Sunak. Um, Rishi Sunak was a junior minister um, housing communities and local government. He then became chief secretary to the treasury um, when the new prime minister took office. And Sunak has been for a long time a strong advocate of free ports, free trade zones, and the reshaping of the UK economy. Unsurprising, he represents a North Yorkshire constituency. So one of his real driving concerns is how the post-Brexit opportunities can be used to rebalance the UK economy, to encourage manufacturing, to encourage chemical processing in the Northeast, advanced manufacturing in the Southwest. And if there is any merit in Brexit, then that is, I think, where it would lie. And that would at least give some intellectual cogency to the, frankly, agonizing process we've been through in the last three years. Uh, um, you brought up a lot of points, uh, and so did Patricia, and of course, uh, starting with, but, you know, the, in the U.S., when we look at the U.S. economy and we, then we compare it with the economies around the world, um, frankly, we, the underlying uh, um, characteristic what we look for is not only the business trade, but what is happening with the population. And I'm, I'm afraid Europe has a big, big problem. Europe's demographic is in a literal demographic crisis, the full impact which is still not fully appreciated. It is now the world's oldest continent with a median age close to 45, and its working age population is projected to decline by some 50 million people by 2035. In the East, this problem has been compounded by what it's called, not immigration, emigration. Croatia has lost 5% of its population since 2013. Bulgaria's current population is projected to drop by 23% in the next 20 years. My question will start with um, Mr. Philipson. And I, I, I want to start with the US, UK. Why should US, US has lots of problems. You sort of mentioned a couple of them. US right now needs to get the China thing done in terms of trade. We need to have that agreement done. And it, I'm not saying that they can only do one at a time, but clearly that seems to be the biggest thing. Why should US be even interested in doing a deal with the UK? Could you explain that to me a little? Um, I think I have two thoughts, really, um, uh, and against the, uh, but maybe if I can just say one, if I may, about you know, an observation about what is going on in Europe. Um, because I, you know, I think we can debate the causes of uh, the referendum vote in June 2016, but in a way, um, I think you, this is now the time to look forward, uh, and I think that's really important for, for us as a, as a system. Um, and uh, in terms of the UK and the US, why should the US want to do uh, an agreement with us? I think there is still economic benefit to be had. Um, there is, uh, it may not be um, as much as sometimes people rhetorically suggest, but I think there is still significant value add. I also think that there are particular sectors where deepening and strengthening the corridors between the UK and US, including, for example, financial services, advanced manufacturing, uh, creative industries, 
there is real value to be had if you, if you look at existing patterns for trade and how we can accelerate those. Um, I also think, though, that, and this I think maybe takes us into a sort of broader uh, uh, discussion, the UK and the US have operated within the global economy within a certain architecture uh, over the last, well, certainly since the Second World War. To some extent, similar architecture. Well, yes. exactly. And, I mean, it, we, we created it together to some large degree in the, in the 1940s and after the Second World War. Well, not just us, but we were certainly both sitting at that table. Um, my own view is that one thing that we have seen play out that has created the context uh, for quite a number of the issues, including those mentioned by Patricia, is a sense of, you know, that, that sense of public support and the momentum behind a sort of a trend of globalization. I, and I know this is grossly oversimplistic, but that sort of momentum behind globalization has slowed. And for some time now, if we look back, uh, including, I would argue, when I was working in Washington in the early 2000s, um, when there was always a debate, whenever there was a debate about whether to grant free tra uh, fast track authority or trade promotion authority, there always had to be a debate about trade adjustment assistance because that was how we, at that time, in my view, again, simplistically, got through the debate about exactly. the, the cost of, of trade liberalization. And I just think we've sort of lost sight of that a little bit. And I think we need to get back to that. So the reason I mentioned that is I do also believe that there is an imperative for the UK and the US to get back to having a conversation about the type of global economy in which we want to operate and in which we will benefit in order to provide prosperity, in order to provide economic growth and opportunity uh, in order to make our economic model um, sustainable. It's not just us. I would love to include in that the likes of Canada, South Korea, Japan, Singapore, Australia, and a number of the European member states. So, you know, I think we need to get back to that sense of a forward-facing discussion about the type of, economic, uh, type of global economy that we want to live in. And I think at the heart of that, a UK-US, a, a tightening of the UK-US economic relationship, including but not only through an FTA, is important. Uh, uh, Patricia, do you have any thoughts beyond the realm yeah. of what he said? Yeah, it, it's, I find it astounding still. I'm granted four years have passed. But in 2016, when Trump started speaking out against trade, I found it startling that Secretary Clinton, who was running point on a lot of trade, and the Obama administration couldn't articulate why we trade in the first place. Somehow, we've got from trade is good, and we don't pay any attention to the adjustment things, and we can talk about some of the issues with Trade Adjustment Assistant Program, but we've made trade the bad guy. When what we're trying, what we should be trying to get to are the root causes of income, growing income inequality. And somehow, Growing income inequality. It will grow. No, I, the, that's the issue: sure. is growing income inequality. It's true in the UK. It's really true. You don't think that's an issue? No, it's a huge issue, but it's not necessarily a trade issue. People, the problem is, when you see a plant closed in a particular location, it's highly localized. The com a plant closes, an entire community can suffer. So you've got very localized pain. The gains from trade, however, are diffused all over the economy. You know, your toothpaste is cheaper, the you know, computer you put in your, your house, your TV set, all of this stuff becomes relatively cheaper and overall the standard of living can rise. But we've got this growing disparity between the rich and the poor and for some reason, you know, it's become, that's the trade problem. That's not the trade problem. You know, it's a large part an automation problem, a technology issue, and it's something we have to deal with. But I can't believe in such a few short years, we've gone from promoting all types of trade agreements that we could get on a bilateral, multilateral basis to this trade is bad. Well, and much of them, frankly, much of them are coming under severe assault pretty much all over the world. If you look at it, this is not only a U.S. issue because of the nationalism, you know, what, what Mr. Phillips has said, the globalization part has sort of slowed down and nationalism has sort of increased in so many severely that much of these trade packs, if they haven't gotten into trouble, they will be in the, in, in the future. That's at least 
it looks likely. Malcolm, do you have anything to add on this? I think just to pick up on the, the reshaping of the global economy, of which Brexit is a tiny part, that, that's something that's worth thinking about and focusing on. And if you think of it from a technological perspective, there's been a huge development in things like blockchain, distributed ledger technologies that are transforming the way in which supply chains operate. And one of the emerging questions there is how far law and commercial practice, the sort of thing that's regulated through trade agreements, has fallen behind those technological developments. So I think my underlying answer to your question about why should the US and the UK be concerned with trade agreements is that you have to think of supply chains as pipelines. Pipelines only work if they work at each end and in the middle. And um, so, you know, we really do need to kind of reshape the way that the law operates. Shipping, but sorry, shipping, for example, we've got 300 odd years of case law that is concerned with transferring ownership of documents with scant regard for what's in the box. Technology now can tell you down to the box level what's being transported. Law has to change, agreements have to change, governance must change. Um, I want to ask the uh, UK-EU pa potential pact uh, the next question, and then I would like to uh, ask a question about North Carolina. You sort of mentioned that um, in your speech. So let's start with the um, potential EU, which I'm hoping that it will happen. If I'm not mistaken, the transition period uh, ends December 31st, is that right? Um, that seems very little time. What do you have to say, Mr. Philipson? Can a deal be done? Uh, yes. <laughs> 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 and <laughs> and I'm, I, I really am I'm very confident that it will be done. Uh, it can and will. And the reason I say that is because, um, uh, well, again, two thoughts, if I may. First of all, and one I think ties back to uh, everything we've talked about so far. Um, you know, Brexit, the process of the UK leaving the EU is not the only thing that we on the UK side should be spending our time doing, the EU side should be spending its time doing, uh, and absolutely agree with uh, Malcolm's point that it's, you know, it's a small part of the overall set of global issues that we should be spending our time talking about. Um, because I do think that the traditional structures of either global, regional, bilateral management and regulation of our trade have, they, they have served their purpose, but the world has moved beyond them, and that's what we should be spending our time thinking about. Um, I don't know how you come up with a global agreement on blockchain technology or AI, uh, or even some of the more, you know, data. Uh, I don't think the WTO is the place to do it. Um, and so we need to have a serious conversation about where we want to have those conversations about the global rules and norms and frameworks. Um, the reason, though, I'm utterly confident that we can do this deal with the EU is, and again, some of this has been, it sometimes gets you know, played against uh, the, each other's narrative depending on where you want to start, but I think it's, it's, it's an observation I would just make. You know, we know, uh, we, we know where we're starting from, and it is about managing a future relationship between the UK and the EU, which has us, and this is a rather obvious point, coming out of the EU structures and agreeing a future governance of how our economic and indeed security entities will operate alongside each other. Um, and I think there is imperative on both sides to get that done, uh, for again the reasons that uh, others have, been, have pointed out that there are other things for people to focus on, including on the EU side. So I think, you know, we know what we want to do. They have set it out in their documents. The Prime Minister has started setting it out in his remarks, and we will now start to work out our own position. And then we just have to get on and do it, because there are other bigger things but to focus wage, on. The wage part is a big element, is it not? The which part? The wage, the, 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 the worker's wage, the minimum wage part. Well, uh, only as I say, I mean, to be sort of frank about it, if... If the EU wants to say that they're not going to talk about anything else until we agree to operate our economy exactly the same way they operate within the 27, then that's, that's a problem, because that's, but that's not the way to get into this. 
you know, let's focus on the common objective of working out a, an economic agreement between us and then getting on and, and, and implementing it so that we can then focus on uh, the other things that we want to focus on on our side and they want to focus on on their side. Right. Right. Uh, Patricia, do you think they can get a deal done by December 31st, 2020? A deal, yes. Um, is it one you're going to be happy living with in the longer term? I don't know, but you know, trade deals get modified over time. So, you know, a starting point would be useful. And you know, it's not like you're creating it totally out of whole cloth. Um, you're, you've got a relationship with the EU now. You've got a relationship with the U.S. now. We had a lot of negotiations on TTIP um, before the 2016 election. So there's a lot of groundwork for what a modern trade agreement, one that talks about the very issues that you do, you know, not only the technologies of blockchain and AI, but cross-border credentialing, you know, things that are very important as services become a major traded item. Malcolm. Well, I have the luxury of being a lawyer, not a diplomat. So <laughs> therefore I can say that the right answer is it depends. Um, but usually <laughs> on one hand, on the other hand. It <laughs> but I think the, the important point here is that all the way through the Brexit process, the line that we've stuck to is we can only advise on the law as it is, and businesses can only deal with the law as it stands. And one of the things I've found striking over the last three years is that UK businesses have found ways of building in resilience, of using existing legal structures to make sure that they're essentially still open for business. And even if we get to 31st of December 2020, and what we have is a paper-thin agreement with a load of things left outstanding for, for example, when the government's trade advisory panel has been appointed in November, um, lots to do after that. UK business will cope because, you know, frankly, it's well advised. Mm. Uh, just, just to point of reference, the Canada-EU deal, deal, what do you think it took? How many years? Seven. So we're talking 11 months here. <clears throat> All right. Before we open, the, uh, uh, open it to questions from the public, uh, one final question. Uh, it was not here, but North since Everybody, most of us live in North Carolina. I'm kind of curious. Um, um, you mentioned plus or minus 60,000 jobs between um, the UK and North Carolina, which is very impressive, I must say. Uh, what, what do you see North Carolina beyond the beyond a potential UK-US deal. What have you noticed about North Carolina that has impressed the UK government? Um, I'm not sure it's a single thing, and, uh, and again, well, I, say, I... Say the multiple yeah. things, we're okay. No, no. <laughs> but, and, I, and I always hesitate, this is where I do become a diplomat, I hesitate to comment on a place that I've spent you know, fewer than 48 hours in. Um, <laughs> but I will be back, if only so that Ted talks to me again one day. Um, so uh, I just, I, you know, I look at, uh, I sit in New York and I travel around the US, uh, and as I say, I have worked in the US before and I have family in the US, so I've, I've traveled around the place a lot. Um, you know, this is, and, and the reason I think this is a massive opportunity for the UK is that I think both, the, and this really I think goes to Malcolm's point, the UK and the US are both dealing with what is the future of our economic model, both within and of ourselves, in terms of our relationships with our nearest neighbours and in a global context, because I think we are both global economies. Uh, in some sense, you know, I read a piece, a fascinating piece the other day that someone sent to me saying, why do you keep saying the US is a global economy? It's a closed economy. And it may be, in some senses, more closed than the UK economy, just because of the size of it. It's, its innate size, but I would still insist that the US is a global economy. It relies on exports, it relies on investment, it relies on flows of innovation. And this is why, the, the, I said earlier, you know, we have the statistics that we use when we talk about the strength of the relationship in terms of our exports, in terms of our investment, but actually I think the most important thing is, is my contention that the UK and the US 
are, or at least the US for the UK, is both the most important source and destination of our innovation. And that, I think, is something we need to keep unpacking in terms of the types of economy we want to be, the type of world that we want to live in, and the type of relationships that we want to deliver between, going back to what I said earlier, the public sector, the private sector, and academia, and how we can do this together. The UK and the US between us, consistently, we have the top 10 universities in the world. It's usually six to four to the US, but they're a lot bigger than us. Um, you know, we have some of the most innovative companies in the world, and we are investing in each other's economy. But you know, I think, and this really goes to the title of the, the event, this, for all these reasons, we need to sort of get beyond just focusing on whether we're going to be able to recreate through the next relationship what we have had in terms of our relationship with the EU over the last 47 years. Um, we need to look forward. We need to think about what type of economy we want to be. And I just would simply insist that the US will be a key partner in that. And in order to maximize the opportunity of that, we have got to get into all parts of economic opportunity, activity, and growth uh, across this extraordinary country. So North Carolina, for me, on the benefit of fewer than 48 hours, is a you know, real research excellence here through the universities, real centers of excellence in some of the issues around uh, some of the sectors that we care about as well, like financial services, pharmaceuticals, um, and indeed agriculture. Um, and how are we going to bring those conversations together? The real challenge for us, and I, by us I mean my, uh, me and Andrew and his team uh, in Atlanta covering the six states around here from there, is how do we prioritize? You know, we can be overwhelmed by the number of people that we need to talk to, the conversations that we need to have. And that's where you all come in, because we need your help and your guidance to tell us where you think the opportunities are. Because I go back to something I did say in my opening remarks, that at the end of the day, um, or if I, I'm sorry, maybe I didn't say them in my opening remarks, yeah. it's about the third time I've done this version of the speech today, forgive me. At the end of the day, I don't create jobs. You create jobs. So. I I think I did say this bit. Our job is to help you do more business. So, you know, North Carolina and for that, just keep doing this. That's a tip for me to stop. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, I'll, I'll, I will, we'll make collectively, we'll make it easier for you and Andrew. I think uh, you'll see most of the opportunities in North Carolina uh, for the UK. Anyway, open up uh, any questions before we um, end this conversation. Yes, sir. Quite recently, we've seen quite a frame in the agricultural lobby uh, in regards to the trade agreement. So I just really want to know, from your point of view, how much is the UK willing to sacrifice in order to get a good trade agreement with the US? See if this works. Um, so the risk of being really annoying, um, I think sacrifice is the wrong word. I think the conversation that we need to have with the US, and indeed through something we call the Trade and Investment Working Group that has been meeting since the summer of 2017, uh, we have been talking with US colleagues in Washington, uh, not only USTR but the other major departments, about the type of trade agreements that they have done with others. We have watched very carefully what the US has done. Uh, both through uh, NAFTA and then through the renegotiation and uh, into USMCA. You know, trade agreements are about give and take. They are about reaching mutual agreements on mutual benefit. Um, uh, and so I don't think, I think sacrifice is the wrong word. Um, because if you make it a sacrifice, then I think you automatically create sort of a, a sense of resistance to doing the deal. Um, having said that, um, I myself believe, and we have said to our colleagues in London over and over again, but they don't actually need us to say this because they know it themselves. Um, you know, we are not going to get a trade agreement through Congress unless there is something in there that meets the aspirations of all key stakeholders and st key stakeholder groups uh, in the US, and the agriculture lobby is definitely one of them. Uh, will it be some specific issues that people always go on about around chlorine washed chicken or hormone beef? Uh, we'll see where we get to in the negotiation, but as the Prime Minister and others have said, we have an approach that we have taken to food and animal safety standards uh, that we don't intend to have to compromise on. But we will, the, the overall conversation will need to include enough on both sides in order to allow us both to confidently say that this agreement that we plan to reach is in the interests of both economies and then get it approved by publics and indeed parliaments on both sides.
possible sorry. Just picking up on the possible ratification of a US-UK trade deal, um, one of the things that concerns me is a little bit about how Brexit's being sort of drawn into the partisan political uh, environment in the United States. And so many of us know who live here and watch these things carefully that Brexit's become a sort of Republican uh, issue. Um, it divided uh, people in Washington along partisan lines just about as any other issue does these days, just about. Um, and one of the concerns that I have is not necessarily with, with regards to the substance of the agreement, but how uh, Congress uh, might respond to it um, as partisan lines deepen, uh, partisan difference de differences deepen even greater. So we just assume that, um, it's a big assumption, but that Trump gets reelected. It seems highly unlikely to me as a Congress watcher that um, the House will flip. I think, you know, who knows about the Senate, but I think the Democrats will maintain the House. You have a, have a, have a uh, go to Congress, a new Congress, 117th Congress, with this trade agreement, regardless of the content. Uh, my concern is it becomes a sort of political hostage uh, to uh, a lot of these uh, um, partisan uh, disputes that are going on. Um, and it drags out in a way that you didn't see with the USMCA, for example, um, because of the nature of the issue. Is that, does it, is that a that's, that's a question. Does, that, does this concern you? Um, are, are people in Whitehall talking about this as a, as a possible problem, making some kinds of contingencies? No, we got the set up at the moment, and I, and, you know, I don't think we're going to get out of divided government after 2020, and so yeah. we have this environment. What do you do? So um, I'm guessing this one's for me again. Isn't it? Um, um, no, no, no. I, I think actually it's a, it's a really important point, and it links back to the previous question. Um, you know, and uh, again, at the risk of being maybe either simplistic or too blunt, um, you know, there is no trade, trade agreements are a means to an end. Um, there is, in my view, there is no particular magic to an FTA as being sort of the, the end in itself. You do an FTA in order to achieve a certain economic end, uh, which usually involves closer collaboration between two economic entities, and you need to make the case as to why that is in the overall interest. I do think that there is a context in which we're operating, as Patricia said, where uh, absolutely because of the fact that the benefits tend to be dispersed and the costs are localised, but that is why... Um, to, you know, I maybe did answer your question too diplomatically, but I think the, the key point I would make is we, if we want to conclude this agreement, there's no point concluding it in a way that doesn't make it possible to get it ratified on both sides of the Atlantic. And I would emphasize on both sides of the Atlantic because the British Parliament is going to have its say in this as well, uh, which is why I don't think we go into it talking about sacrifice, if I may. So to your point, um, we are acutely aware of uh, you know, political dynamics around uh, these issues, and it's one reason why we have people, uh, in my view, why we bother to have people in Washington in order to report back as to what they are hearing and what you see both publicly and what you hear privately. What I would say we have heard, and I think this has been bipartisan, I don't think it's only been from the President and the Republican Party, we have heard broad support for an FTA with the UK. What we now need to do is get into a process that sets out what that FTA involves, and we need to sustain that support so that when it gets to the Hill to be ratified, it still enjoys bipartisan support. We watched the, the USMCA, the, the NAFTA renegotiation, with intense interest, uh, frankly, for two reasons. One, to see how our Canadian colleagues went about uh, lobbying, effectively, but influencing at a state and local level, and that is something we are aiming uh, to, uh, to replicate. I mentioned earlier uh, this network of uh, senior trade policy advisors who are operating at a state level. It is in large part to build those networks at a local level so that we can make the case at a local level and a state level for the benefits of doing an FTA with the UK, both you know, in the context of negotiating it and then when we get to ratification. But we also watched M USMCA uh, with real interest in terms of the way it played out on the Hill in the end in terms of the engagement between USTR and the USTR, Bob Lighthizer himself, and senior members of the Democratic Party uh, in the House. And that was crucial uh, to getting it there. If, they, if the House stays the same as it is now, uh, or indeed maybe if it remains finely balanced, if we can't get some support from both sides of the aisle for what we end up negotiating with the US, we're going to have a problem. 
So we go into it ex explicitly trying to make this not a partisan issue. And final thought, if I may, and I think there's, there's sort of broader relevance to this in, in my view at least, this is where, you know, it, it, we will do an FTA because we, we now have the ability to do it as a result of our leaving the EU. We need to, in my view, we need to sort of separate it from Brexit. Um, we, we need to separate all of this from you know, this focus on the backward looking bit, which was when we were doing Brexit. We have done Brexit. We have left the EU. Now we are engaged in the process of our future relationship with the EU, our future relationship with the US, our future relationship with the rest of the global economy. And that is not to diminish or to underestimate the challenge of all of the global dynamics and trends and contexts that we will operate within. But I do think we need to look forward. No, I mean, being, you're right to be aware of the political reality that you're dealing with, you know, so pretending like it didn't exist. But, you know, the, the combination of things that would be wanted from the Dem side, which would be um, wage and environmental parts of it to balance with what the re Republicans traditionally have wanted in trade agreements, you know. And again, you know, getting away from the word sacrifice. And the word compromise has become like the word trade, just, you know, bad. And it's like, it's, it's so ridiculous when you think about it. But the, the compromise part, yes, it's not gonna be perfect for the US, yes, it's not gonna be perfect for the UK, but you know what? In total, it's better than it would have been without it. And, you know, we've gotta get back to the traditional rules of lawmaking. I think it's absolutely right and sensible to think about the political context within which negotiations will be carried out. So you have the Irish Congressional Caucus um, in the US who are obviously rightly concerned with potential impacts on the Belfast Agreement flowing from the um, uh, Irish Sea border. There are clear areas of uh, potential difficulty, depending on how ambitious the UK-EU trade agreement is, uh, is going to be. And the Canadians found that when the Walloons managed to hold things up for a number of months. So I think that febrile political atmosphere is a given. From a business perspective, again, that takes me back to my point, we can only advise and businesses can only adapt to the legal position as it is. And so, you know, I think that's really where we, we have to focus our attention and let the diplomats, the negotiators and the politicians arrive at the conclusions that they eventually manage to reach. Thank you. So, so uh, it's quite interesting to hear you say your answers, Malcolm, because uh, when we would talk in China about uh, what is the Chinese government going to do with changing labor law and changing f trade law, the, all the big consulting science would say the same thing. Well, the law today is, and we'll advise you about the law tomorrow when it's official. So what is, so I, I think that's absolutely spot on, and I think that's the way business needs to work. No question. Uh, yes, yes. Um, Deloitte does uh, quarterly surveys of CFOs, and my colleagues in the, in the UK did their quarterly survey. And it's really interesting that CFOs are a lot more optimistic now than they were three months ago. Just have, they might hate the results, and indeed, the vast majority of them think that Brexit is gonna be a somewhat or significant negative impact on their businesses. but. They're just more optimistic because, okay, now we know it is not a split government. This is going to happen, and, and um, December 31st is it. So this, you know, to your point, businesses can adapt once the uncertainty part is at least tamped down a bit. With that, we close the panel discussion. Thank you, Anthony, Patricia, and Malcolm. Wonderful. <laughs>